Yes, Mr. Savvy. My lords, um, when we broke, I was making submissions about Putnam. Just one thing, I, I, I need to move on, but one thing that I would just <coughs> emphasise about Putnam is the language that Lord Justice Bingham, as he then was, used towards the end of par uh, page 759 in that passage where he talks about collective in integrity. And he talks about the high regard in which juries are held uh, depending on their collective integrity and their individual integrity. And, and that's important in one sense because it demonstrates how, in our submission, judges actually, although obviously judges need to avoid discharging unnecessarily because it's a waste of resources, etc. At the same time, judges should not be reluctant if the circumstances uh, arise to discharge the jury because it's by doing that that the regard of the jury is in one sense preserved. It has one other factor, that it, 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 it has one other result it, which in our submission is demonstrated by the facts of this case and explains why discharging the jury is not that uncommon, it, we would submit, and that's that it, discharging the jury in the right circumstances prevents people having to then exercise appeal rights, essentially potentially being held on appeal, in, on, in custody rather, until the appeal is held. It ensures effectively that someone's fair trial rights are vindicated as soon as possible. <coughs> I'm going to move on fairly quickly because of time but there are a couple of things I just want to uh, make a couple of points I want to make about the suggestion which seems to be at the heart of the prosecution case essentially which is that all of this could be dealt with by jury directions and the point I want, the first point I want to make is it links back to the question or the point I think my Lord Lord Reed put to me just before lunch Jury directions obviously are, can be, I, said, I was about to say are, but I don't think it will <coughs> always be the case, and that's why I changed my language. Jury di directions can be important ways of, main, of keeping a trial on track. The fundamental problem, though, in this case, there are two fundamental problems that explain why jury directions even if they had been in stronger terms than the ones in this case, would not have been uh, <coughs> enough. Hmm. And, that, and that the two pro fundamental problems are this. Firstly, it goes back to a point I made this morning, one of the jurors had already take, been willing to offer bribes. He was willing to break the law. Directions <coughs> assume that, you, that, that the juror will comply with what they're being told. But if a juror is willing to uh, demonstra <coughs> demonstrate that they are willing to break their oath, willing to act unlawfully, directions cannot solve that in, a, in our submission. The second problem with a direction is that implicit in Putnam, uh, and what is said in Putnam uh, about uh, the, the uh, potential for late reporting, for example, demonstrating uh, that, that, that a juror had um, failed to comply with their oath and was um, going to be unable to avoid being biased. Implicit in Put Putnam it is the need to know how far the poison has spread, to use the language of Putnam, before giving a direction, because directions will only work if, uh, 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 if, if the poison hasn't spread too far or hasn't become too deeply in embedded in, in individuals' um, thought-making process. Here, because of the limited information about what had actually occurred, uh, in our submission, there was no way of knowing whether the directions were sufficient. And that's one of the reasons why questioning the jury can be important. We would say, and I'll come back to this in reply if necessary, but, 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 it, but it, 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 it's probably clear from our case, in any event, all that was said in this case, of course, was that the jury were reminded of their oath. Smith, I won't take you to it, but it's 7671, House of Lords at Para 24, makes it clear that directions need to be apposite, clear and emphatic. They were not in this case. And there's no reason why the jury couldn't have been expressly addressed effectively about uh, uh, um, bribes and how they should ignore the bribery attempt, uh, because, of course... On the evidence given, or the, the account given by the forewoman, not technically evidence, but on the account given by the forewoman, 
everyone was aware that there'd been this approach. Uh, 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 everyone was aware that one of their number had been placing a, a bribe. But as I say, fundamentally in our submission, this was a case, and there have to be those cases, where it had just gone too far. The Crown has raised the issue of the proviso. In our submission, the proviso is inappropriate in this context, and we've certainly, neither side has been able to identify, as far as I'm aware, any case where the proviso has been applied in circumstances where an appellate court has reached the conclusion that um, uh, uh, that, 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 that uh, uh, bribery or similar problems have occurred. The reason for that in our submission is this. Under the Charter, as you've seen, there is a constitutional right to be tried by an independent tribunal. The Jury Act, unsurprisingly given what is uh, common practice in many countries around the world, provides that that trial must be by a jury. No one has, in this case, none of the defendants in this case, have waived their right to trial by jury. Waiver, we make reference to it. Again, I won't take you to it because it's probably trite. Miller, Miller and Dixon, Lord Bingham, waiver has to be voluntary, informed and unequivocal. The reference to that, if you want it, is page 7008, paragraph 31. So no one has waived, waived their rights. If the proviso were to be applied by this court in relation to the jury issues, it would be this court then effectively deciding on guilt, having not heard any evidence, having not been able to assess the witnesses, having inevitably, and this is no criticism of, either, of, of any party, uh, having inevitably limited information. And that's, as I say, not consistent with the, with the rights that I've just described, the, the clear rights as a matter of Jamaican law to trial by an independent jury. That's why, in our submission, the Court of Appeal was right in Brown to say it doesn't matter what, effectively, paraphrasing what the strength of the evidence was, um, because there, uh, 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 because ultimately there was a, 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 a right to trial by an impartial tribunal. We <coughs> submitted yesterday a judgment in the Supplementary Authorities Bundle by Chandon, which is a judgment of the uh, Court of Appeal of Guyana. Page 16 and 17 of that supplementary bundle, which is page 226 and 227 of the report, which is last two lines of page 16 and the first uh, five of the next page, adopts the approach I've just described, which is saying you can't apply the proviso because there was a constitutional right to trial by 11 jurors. Actually, not a constitutional right, but a right as a matter of law to trial by 11 jurors. <coughs> One of the reasons for that, it, 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 I've given a number of, sort of fun, fairly fundamental reasons. That, that's obviously also consistent with the approach in Putnam, as I, as I took you to. One specific reason for that is that, as this court will be aware, and it, as is clear, for example, in the judgment in Bonnet-Taylor, which is in the authorities at 6289, paragraph 20, um, the normal approach that is often adopted in, in things like fresh evidence cases uh, is to consider the impact, essentially, of whatever occurred or didn't occur on the jury's on, on the jury. Well, in a fresh evidence case, one can do it, and what that does is respect the role the jury plays. It looks at what the jury must have concluded, which is that the individual is, who's appealing his guilt was guilty, and then considers what impact fresh material might have. Here one doesn't have that starting block, and that's why applying the proviso essentially would be this court determining for itself guilt, because it doesn't have a reliable, it doesn't have a reliable starting point. So in my submission, it's not surprising 
that simply that there doesn't appear to be any case where the proviso has been applied in a case where there's a problem with 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 with, with the jury. Well, a problem in the sense of certainly a lack of independence. I mean, there may be other problems, but. Well, Lord, I can... My Lord is, is, is I'm, so, no, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not meaning to look pained. Yes. I'm trying to remember I'm trying to remember an authority. We had a case in this court we had a case in the Supreme Court um, a few years ago where the judgment was given by Lord Wilson um, to do with unfairness uh, by a trial judge. Yes. And um, the court in, in, in the judgment, Lord Wilson said words to the effect that um, a judgment which is the result of an unfair procedure is a thing writ in water from which nothing can follow. And one might, you might rely on that idea uh, in relation to a verdict by a jury which one could not be confident was an unprejudiced jury. Well, my Lord, it, it, yes, but in one sense, I would put it even higher because of the role, because of the role the jury plays in our system, because of the importance of the integrity of the jury being preserved, and because there is, in particular, a constitutional right to um, a, to, to, to an impartial and independent tribunal. I mean, I, it's. It, they are fit, they are really important rights within the system of criminal justice to to, to state the obvious, to state the the, 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 the and you are potentially um, uh, uh, denying that. I, I'm helpfully. It's extraordinary. How quick juniors are these days? Um, Seraphin, I'm told, is the court, the That's judgment, right. yeah. para 49. Yes. <laughs> yes. Turning then to the issue of time of jury, I'm not going to spend very much time on it, partly because obviously, in one sense, the jury shouldn't have been retiring at all on our case. Um, but it does, in one sense, add to the overall uh, concerns about this case because it's quite clear and the Court of Appeal re re recognised this uh, essentially that one of the reasons why the, 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 the judge was keen to get the jury out so as to speak is because the trial couldn't continue uh, 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 um, without that juror and so you had the, this situation where there was a potential need to take action against a juror who um, and, you, and so a verdict, a quick verdict was being sought. Now, the Jamaican bench book uh, clearly recognises the potential pressures that can be put on a jury, and we would submit that one of the problems, if you have a jury that already has poison within it, to use that language again, one of the problems with pressure, the, the problems of pressurising the jury become even more intense. And that, the reason for that simply is that if a jury is going to be potentially, uh, 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 is, is going to potentially be in, influenced by unconscious bias, that risk increases if, the, if, if, if people are effectively pressurised to take a quick decision, not think through the evidence. You go to your prejudices, unfortunately. If you t tend to, some people tend to go to their prejudices if they're under pressure. Uh, that's the simple point I'm making. And that, th there is clearly a recognition now that sending a jury out late puts pressure on them, and it particularly puts pressure on them in a, in, in, in a situation such as Jamaica, where there is no opportunity, essentially, for the jury to be discharged. They know they're going to be kept together. They're not going to be able to go home until they reach a verdict. That's recognised. The, the passage I'm, I, I've been referring to in the bench book is at page 6801, paragraph 5 of the um, bench book, which uh, recognises what it describes as a 3 p.m. benchmark, but recognises flexibility both ways. And so in complex cases, remember this is apparently one of the longest criminal trials in Jamaican history, um, in complex cases it may be necessary to complete the um, uh, uh, summation earlier than 3 p.m. to avoid pressure. I'm sorry, could you give me that page number? Sorry, 6801, and it's paragraph 5. 
8601. No, 6801. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry, no, that's, I, I, that was probably me. But... No, no, uh, 8801. And of course, in this case, you had the added complication that, that when the jury was sent out, they came back, essentially, um, at 5.35, were asked if they'd reached a unanimous verdict and said they hadn't. The reference to this is 5176. The prosecutor then pointed out that they'd not been out for two hours, which is the point at which a majority verdict would be reached. There's no direction essentially saying uh, you may want to, uh, you, you need to try and reach a unanimous verdict. That's um, inconsistent with another passage of the bench book that is <coughs> at um, 8362. And can I ask, in, in, in Jamaica, if they, um, if they go out and they haven't returned a verdict by a reasonable time in the evening, is the practice to send the jurors home, or are they sequestered in a hotel? They, they cannot night? be sent home, so they have to be um, sequestered, basically. Yeah. Um, yes. And so, and so are they kept in a hotel under court supervision? That would be my understanding of what we like. But obviously, the, the, the bench book is premised on the idea that it's ideal that that doesn't happen, really. Yeah, um, but even sending... I, mean, I know from my own experience, even, even sending out the jury earlier in the day, mm. that you can still have them um, out overnight. Yes. Yes, absolutely, obviously, and, and, and that's not on... Not, not uncommon. In, in fact, sometimes it takes a number of days before yes. they yes. return a verdict. But does sequestering happen in, in, in Jamaica? Because I noticed there was another case where no. the hearing went until 1.30 in the morning, no. where you would have thought they'd all be in a hotel by then. Not, no, in practice, sorry, I should have been clear. In practice, the, the, it, it, it doesn't, because there's just no real provision for it. So it's, right. it, the jury just stay late. But there is a rule right. that they can't be separated once they The jury act is clear on that. Yeah. They can't be separated. So yeah. it can, deliberations can go on for days and they'll just be kept well, without being sequestered in a hotel? Well, in principle, I suspect in reality that doesn't happen because of the natural... Pro, pro, I mean, I, I, we haven't put this in because it, it, it didn't seem relevant, but I, there, there is old English ca oh, yes. case law about juries being just reaching verdicts at three in the morning. Yeah. Yes, well, the, yes. the leading case on... Um, on uh, coercion of a jury is one where the judge refused to let them have anything to eat or drink until they returned a verdict. <laughs> um, have yes. you got the reference to the Jury Act indicating that the jury cannot be... Yes. Um, ...once they've started it's, deliberation, can't be... Yes, I, I'll, uh, I'll get... Sent home. I, I, it's, um, I have got that in my notes, sorry. Well, don't bother now, but if it's not immediately, if, if somebody could just... Yeah, no, sorry, I just... Um, it's section 47 of the Jury Act, which is electronic bundle 6805. Thank you. I think, actually, just sort of as an aside, it was George, George Davis, if you remember the George Davis is yes. innocent. He was a, a, an, an early hours of the morning verdict, if that's a sort of historic... That's not that long ago. Yeah. But they can be sent home, as I understand it, before they start to deliberate. Mm. Yes. So well, the judge who finishes something up, say, at tea time, could just say to the jury, Yeah. Well, come well that's back, why. Come back tomorrow and you'll deliberate. Well, that's why the bench book makes express reference to when, the, when, yes. finish, when you finish your summa summation, because that's really what determines it. So, what, what I suspect happens, I, I mean, I. I, I it, my experience of English courts. Save the last direction about exactly. unanimity well, look, and for yeah. electing a foreman until first thing the next morning. Yeah. Exactly, and that's not uncommon even in England where yes. you're getting late. Regular. You, you, yeah. you have two minutes worth of summing up. Yeah. But paragraph five in the bench book rather suggests that um, the solution is not if you finish your summing up late to send them home, but not to finish your summing up late. Well, I think the. the, the, the it's because of the technical issue of when do their deliberations start. But you, all you need to do yes, is, is have like one line of your summing up, and that okay. just save the so, last sentence of your summing right. up. Yeah. Okay. 
47.3 at page 6805 does imply, well, it does say that the judge can give directions as regards accommodation. Yes, but I, I understand in practice, and obviously I don't have direct experience, but those who do tell me this, that in practice that's not, not, not applied. Thank you. Final issue, and I, 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 as I said, there are obvious issues in relation to the time in this case, um, particularly given the complexity of the case. Um, in terms of uh, what you should do if you, you're with me and have concluded that uh, the conviction should be quashed and the proviso shouldn't be applied, we would invite the court not to remit. Um, this has obviously been outstanding. The, the, the appellants have all been in custody since, since the 30th of September two, 2011. Um, that delay will, is likely to have had an impact on evidence. Um, there are, as the court will be aware, because of the application for expedition, there are uh, issues uh, with uh, the health of one of the appellants. Um, there are also obviously constitutional issues, but they've been denied, we would submit, constitutional issues, even if it's the jury point, they had a, due, a, a constitutional <coughs> right to a fair trial. If we're wrong about that, though, we would invite you to consider remitting to the Court of Appeal so that the Court of Appeal can consider the issue of retrial. Um, that, I think, con concludes all I have to say. I think Mr. M Mr. Buchanan has some additional submissions. Yes. Yes, Mr. Buchanan. Have you please the court? Ladies. I just wish to make a point, a couple points, but to start with questions, the clarifications to questions. The first one being raised by, by Lord Lloyd Jones, and this would have been in relation to. In, in relation to the chamber hearing. Now, in, 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 the Jamaican, in the Jamaican context, the right of the accused to be present at all stages of the proceedings, uh, the concept of the chair chamber hearing, respectfully, would be that the courtroom would become the chamber. Yeah. So the, the gallery would be cleared, mm. and certainly the attorneys, the representatives, and, and then you would have the accused there. The, this, bench, the, the bench book says that. The, that, that that's correct. But well, in, in that situation, because it was, it was uh, a situation within the transcript which reflects that it was actually a conversation between one of the appellants and the son of the jury. She didn't actually see or, or confronted the appellant. Mm -hmm. And so she was concerned. So she only cared information, and the, the inquiry didn't go as far as to, to, to find out the truth of that inquiry. Yeah. And so it led to a discharge. What, what follows from that is the opportunity would have been lost for the, any of the, the appellants, if questioned, or if, to, to say, well, this is not true. And then the judge would have made an informed decision. What follows from that also is that the forewoman, for, the foreman, she was a part of the, the questioning. She was then asked if she was allowed to, if she could continue. She says, I'm only worried about the safety of the lady, the juror number 11. And she leaves knowing the information and it's fresh in her mind and remains in her mind. We have no way of knowing but to speculate what how much conversations outside of that would have gone to the other jurors. Then, moving back to the next inquiry number three, it is the same four women and more conversations about her role. And, and so the taint or the poison would have gone back as far as November in a 65-day trial and before juror number 11 left. So a proper inquiry could have found out, especially in a space where we do not know at what point, or, or if any, when, when it is exactly 
the responses or if the other jurors could have said that that wasn't the case at the time, if a proper inquiry and asking each and every juror, not even suggesting that it be done on the oath, but if it was asked what their responses would have been for the judge to make an informed decision. And I say this in the context that in light of the fact that our constitution it places even a duty on the judge to, as the custos morum of the constitution, to protect the right of the the appellants, that it was incumbent on him to ensure that he makes the inquiry so he protects the fair trial right. So that would be in response to your question as it connects. It connects. So what flows from that then is when we get to the late retirement, we have a, a, a juror who is the fruit of the poisonous tree or the, the introduction of the poison, no knowledge of how far the poison is. I'm not inviting the court to speculate, but that's all we are left to do respectfully. And what happens in that situation is we don't know if the pressure arises because there, were, there, there was a situation where these jurors were able to say, I would participate in a bribe, allegedly, or not. And so the verdict that comes could never be a true verdict in light of that. So that's the submission as it connects from incident two to incident three. Now, in relation to provis the proviso, and I think you had knocked some of the win out of Ms. Lord Reed because I would have borrowed your words in, in, in the judgment to say that you can't proviso unfairness, you can't proviso injustice. It's just not possible. It would be an absurdity in the law. Uh, now, in, in, in relation to Lord Simla, Lady Simla. Simla. You asked a question about the balancing of rights, mm. the, the balancing exercise. I would submit to you that the, the Jamaican constitution, in particular the charter, it came at a time post the Phipps decision. So there was a lot said about um, King and, <coughs> and, and certainly Phipps, the Phipps judgment. But at that time, it was presumption of constitutionality. And certainly, the onus was on the appellant, on the appellant to prove the, the privacy right violation. Post the judgment in Phipps, our legislators, which our, par our parliament certainly has that ability to represent the people, and they would have thought that as a matter of public interest, the, ch the very right, the charter rights, in particular, the communication rights, which is for all, the least among us has that right, was to be protected in such a way that where there is a breach of that right, it's a distinct difference. What difference is that, Lady Simna would have asked, is that the judge, is now, the judge now has a duty to carry out the Oaks test or the demonstrably justifiable test. Because somebody says, and in response to Lord Reed, but the, the appellants are not here to complain of that right. But they did, at first instance, do their counsels collectively. And at that, that basic complaint about the right follows that it, the judge is to call upon the prosecutor to say that it is demonstrably justified because there is no issue before this court that there was a breach. The effect of the breach or the balancing exercise can only begin <coughs> after the prosecutor has met the burden of demonstrably justifiable. So, can, can, can I ask Mr. Buchanan, uh, yes. while you're addressing us on the charter, um, as I understand it, the charter um, is formally, um, is part of a constitution it's a, it, was in, it was made part of a constitution by a constitutional amendment in 2011. That is right? correct. Was it preceded by some sort of um, review or report? The, my, my, my learned friend, actually, Mr. 
Salty Casey actually um, made mention of, of the review and the report. Oh, but right what is significant check, that check my notes. <laughs> right. What is significant that comes from it is yeah. that, and we take pride in this, and I'm, I'm quoting, I'm, well, I'm paraphrasing our, our Chief Justice, and it is, it's, found, thank you, it's found in the written case at 12 and 13. Yes. Right, thank you. Yes, but what we, as I was saying earlier, we take pride to say that this amendment, which is separate from any other Caribbean jurisdiction, was for, for us, it was made by us, and it was a testimony of our, our, road, our, our, our evidence of independence. Yes. Where we, had, we, where we decided what rights would be protected, and especially the dynamics of the Jamaican society yes. is the importance of protecting the least among us. And was it intended that it be um, developed, uh, um, I, I suppose, uh, I, was it meant to be what you might call a, an autochthonous um, bill of rights, if we can call it that, that would be developed by the Jamaican judiciary in light of the circumstances in Jamaica, or was it intended to be um, influenced by um, uh, comparative human rights jurisprudence looking at other charters of rights and constitutional guarantees in other countries? I'm, I'm happy that you asked that question, because we did look and I'm saying we because I, I take pride in being Jamaican. But we did look at other jurisdictions such as South Africa, mm -hmm. and if you if you even the Canadian, uh, the Canadian and the yeah. United States. But what you'll see, what a, a clear, a clear indication. And again, my friend is indicating that it's in the written case yeah. at 20 and 21. Yeah. But what what what's significant is that what what is clear is that there is similar to in the Canadian jurisdiction that the, the, the test, which is the demonstrable justifiable test, is mandatory once, the right is, once there is a breach. Mm -hmm. And before us now is that there was a breach. Yeah. The learned judge, and I, I will say this respectfully, this came at a time when the charter was very young. And so the contemplation to give effect to it, as judges do in interpreting the intent of, of the legislature. Oh, yes. Yes, and I, and I see paragraph 13 yes. draws our attention to what the Chief Justice, uh, Chief Justice Sykes, has, Correct. has Correct. said, that it's, not, it's autochthonous, which means it's indigenous, homegrown, originating with us, rather than imposed from outside. Yeah. And the, the, what, what, what is key, which I, will, which I will get to, and I agree with you, and I adopt the words of, mm -hmm. of, of our Chief Justice, yep. is, is, the, is the fact that after looking at constitutions all over the world, what we decided is what is important to us. So what we have is a section 13 b and I know there are many persons, I quote it so much that it becomes an annoyance to many, but 13 to the protection given to every citizen on the 13 b it is the last flicker or, or shimmer of light to what it is to be a human. Yep. And it, 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 it separates the state clearly from the, 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 the human being. And, and it, it, it says, listen, all state actors have a duty not to abridge, abrogate, or breach the rights. And when you do that, you must show that it is demonstrably justifiable. So in, in an answer, yes, thank you. So in, in an answer to that, ladies and gentlemen, that balancing exercise as to the evidence when it was asked about, especially in relation to what was on JS2, doesn't even begin to come up until after the judge would have made that, carried out that exercise of the demonstrably justifiable test, and he did not do it. Yeah. So we have nothing on the record as to any submissions from the state, from the Crown, to say, here, it, it, notwithstanding, it is justifiable. There were less restrictive measures, or here is why there is a breach. So we don't have that before us, and that is, that, that is the one flaw in the judge's acceptance. And he, he, evidence of that is he was concerned. He made words to um, my 
senior Mr. Taylor who is in the room, that if he was not daunted by the change in the charter because there, and the significance of it, the response at that level was nothing much changes even after the concession. But we do recognize the importance of it, but to submit to the court that the test wasn't done and so there's no balancing exercise to which could have happened. And, and, and because this is our apex court, the apex court would, could not respectfully substitute what the judge at first in, instance ought to have done. And in those circumstances, the answer to question A, <coughs> where evidence was collated, collected, and secured. So secured would have been the request from the police officer. The collection and collating would have been the what flows from JS2, the cell site, the text messages, the call positioning, what, what, whatever flows from JS2. But all of that would have been no moment. And a key thing before I depart, because I, I don't want to take up too much time or well, you, you, don't, you don't have a great deal of time left. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was being cheeky, Lord Reed, but I, I didn't know you would figure me out. <laughs> but but the, the, key, the, key, the key thing in, in, in relation to, to, to that aspect is to understand that as we make heavy weight of JS2, what's incumbent on the judge was that in a demonstrably justifiable test, I would submit respect to, respectfully that the, in the absence of JS1, which was the controlled copy that the police officers did not have access to, and where the much, much counsel from the lower level, which with Tom Tavares, KFC, would have said, listen, this is a, a man from Ireland who would have come, would have come to Jamaica, not given any effect to the right, and he gives testimony <coughs> This is Simmons, and he doesn't say whether he knows exactly what's in each and every file. And we have nothing to cross-reference, so they would have failed on that test. The, the last thing I will say before I take my seat, Alois, I'm a lady, is in relation to the trial, the jury, the jury point, is I Certainly, and I, I've read uh, for this case about four years. In relation to the jury point, there it has never been in the modern common law where a jury who we know for a fact is poisoned, is tainted, was allowed to remain on a jury to bring a verdict simply because the legislation would have prevented him from being discharged, where it is clear on its face that that juror ought to have been removed to protect the fair trial right. And it is in that vein that I will say that there is no cure, no proviso, or, or, or no thought of a retrial or a second bite of the apple where the unfair trial right was breached in the manner that it did in the circumstances from incident two to incident three, and then the, the justification for breaching what we know is common practice in the Jamaican space to ensure that you leave one sentence so that the deliberation takes place on the next day. And that would be my submission, that the conviction should be quashed or ought to be quashed, in, and I trust you always been on, on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Yeah, my name is Simon. I'm on stand self for chat my nine and say, no, say, oh, they are represent for war is entertainment. You hear that? Go check them out now on YouTube. Be a bad upload. You hear that? Believe what I tell you. From my bottom, no, say, man, for great. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel.